Well, um, CERN and I have just been uh, talking about hurricanes in Florida, and he says he wants me to shh about the fact that the historic season that everybody predicted for this year has not yet developed. What is it with forecasting the weather? Anyway, CERN, <laughs> what other hurricanes, what other turbulent weather can we discuss this morning, maybe in terms of companies and stocks and things like that? Yes. Well, hi, Randy. We we had a bit of a hard game last night, I think, with NVIDIA's earnings. Yes. <laughs> um, in it fact, it I would say it's more than a hard game. <laughs> it reminded me when I used to be an Apple nut like I am a Tesla nut now. And you'd, you'd listen to the, the earnings report and you'd be like, wow, that's great. That's great. That's great. The stock's going down. <laughs> and now Tesla, same thing. And now NVIDIA is following suit. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Well, I'd like to give your viewers some uh, some context for this. Okay. Um, what we're seeing play out in the markets is a bit of Wall Street gamesmanship. And it's important, I think, for people not to lose sight as to what's really going on. Okay. Okay. So this morning I posted this, and I think this is uh, an image that tells you exactly what's happening. <laughs> Let's see <laughs> Let me see okay. if I can understand it here. <laughs> so what we have here is, oh, uh, I'm kind of mixing metaphors here, but I'm kind of labeling this as a tectonic shift in, in technology, in the technology landscape. Yeah. And what we have is a bunch of dinosaurs. It's funny how tech companies now, I'm calling them dinosaurs, <laughs> are all standing around. You know, they're having a good time. They're, they're the, the dominant species, you know, of the land. And uh, feeling pretty good about themselves and their competitive position. And then along comes, uh, out of the blue, this NVIDIA meteorite. <laughs> and changes everything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, you'll note in the bottom right corner, there's a little chicken sitting on a nest. <laughs> and that chicken is sitting on... A couple of eggs, and those eggs are autonomous vehicles and humanoid robots. I see. For Tesla. And so I'm suggesting that what NVIDIA is enabling actually is going to help Tesla. Of course, Tesla has their own, you know, AI chips and et cetera, and so on, and their own approach. But NVIDIA is kind of heralding this new world that we're, we're rapidly entering. Right. I, I did, by the way, also see an article this morning that suggested that Apple, uh, which is seeing some pretty good stock action right now, could be the other company to get a massive boost from actual embodied AI with their releases that are coming next week. Uh, next week, 8th, I think, the 8th? Is it the 8th that they're having their... Not certain of the date, but yeah, it's coming up. Yeah, an eighth or ninth, I think. Maybe it is the ninth. Anyway, uh, with the with their new uh, 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 reveal, uh, that uh, they might have some big surprises coming for us in terms of the AI aspects of your handheld device. Yeah, Apple, in theory, is extremely well positioned uh, for an AI future. The question is, can they capitalize on it? Right. And it would be disappointing if they don't. Right. Um, they've had every advance warning that's needed to to get themselves ready for this, but um, we'll we'll see. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. yeah. So let's um, dive into Nvidia a little bit, and before we get to earnings, I just want to lay some groundwork. So this is Jensen in a presentation he made. I think it was back in June um, at Computex, May or June this year, and he said that that. Um, AI researchers discovered NVIDIA in 2012, and that was NVIDIA's first contact with AI. To their credit, they didn't just dismiss it, they explored it, and they went and visited with these researchers and understood what their needs were. And they discovered that, that GPUs actually were very helpful in what the researchers were doing in AI research. Fast forward to 2016, and they delivered their first essentially AI computer to open AI. And if you look at that image, look who's standing next to Jensen. Yeah, of course. <laughs> right? It's one of those things where you look at uh, photos from history and there's like one guy in every photo. <laughs> yeah. And that's that's Elon in this case. 
uh, he, he's there for many important moments in computing history at this point. Yep. Okay, so the first AI supercomputer was delivered to OpenAI in 2016. And then we have our chat GPT moment. Um, is it 2023 or 2022? 2020, Late 22? November, October, November, 2022. We're just yeah. coming up to two years. It seems like a decade. It does. It does. And on this chart, they're showing 2023, I guess, when ChatGPT really took off. But yeah, the moment was late 2022. And so, you know, a lot's been discussed about these large language models. You feed it a ton of data into the model to develop the model, and then you can have a conversation with it, for example. All right. And right now, we all know the limitations of ChatGPT. We've interacted with it. We see the challenges it tends to just make stuff up. Right. Right. Now, my daughter, when she was four, she would make a lot of stuff up too. So if you kind of use an analogy of, of human development, okay, it's, it's that, at this point, it was like a little toddler. You could speak with it. You could reason with it a little bit, but it made stuff up. Now, over time, it's getting better. And the, as we discussed last week, the forecast is it to become you know, more and more intelligent pretty quickly. Okay, so that, that's one thing, but what's really happening is this, is that computers are learning different languages, right? So computers understand text, they understand audio, they understand images, right? And video and even DNA and protein and molecules. And what's neat is now we can translate text to image text to audio, image to text. You can go back and forth now between these languages. It's like translating French to English and Spanish and Japanese. We just have a now another set of languages of things before that we didn't really understand to be languages, but effectively they are. Right. DNA is just a language. Protein is just a language. And computers now understand them well enough or will that we can now just have a conversation with computers about any one of these things or convert, you know, text to DNA or DNA to text or vice versa. And so that's an amazing development. And I think we don't truly understand the implications of this yet. We're just, we're just beginning to see this. For sure. Okay. So the first time in human history, we now have a way to translate between all these different modalities. Phenomenal. Right. And we've maybe personally played around with, you know, text to images. And that's been pretty cool. Not perfect, but pretty cool. Kind of fun. It'll soon be text to video and, and beyond. Okay. All right. So Jensen talks about AI factories. So think of cloud computing where you've got racks and racks of CPUs, servers, that when you query the internet, hits that server, it gets you the information and feeds it back to you. Well, an AI factory is racks and racks of GPUs that when you hit that server, it does some thinking essentially and gives you back a response. So rather than searching the internet, it is determining the answer itself. And he's calling this a new industrial revolution. That this, this is a foundational shift in the world of computing from one of search and retrieval to one of actual generation of intelligence. Right. And then the implication for that on the right side is that this is going to impact everything, not just computing, but healthcare, transportation, manufacturing, literally everything in the economy. And Jensen says that this is foundational much in the way that electricity was foundational to the world, that that allowed a building block that allowed you to do so many different things. He, he puts this on par with that. And if he is right, then we haven't seen anything yet from NVIDIA. And this and this uh, particular chart was a Jensen chart, and you'll notice how many of those images to the right are Elon Musk companies, and even Tesla company T Tesla <laughs> products. That's right. That's a good point. And and two massive ones certainly are going to be autos, and then humanoid robots. Not to mention robotics and manufacturing. There's right. Tesla right here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But it's literally going to affect every single industry healthcare, computing, and everything in between, finance, absolutely everything. Right. 
Uh, so this is a chart, and I won't go over all the detail here, but he's saying that AI is the greatest technology force of our lifetime. Data centers across industries will become AI factories. Right, so, you know, AI has fundamentally changed what software can make and how you make software. Yeah, and it, so on. So it's just examples here of the you know, different things that AI is going to impact. And this is just scratching the surface. Yeah. And that might have been one of the most interesting parts to me of the call yesterday was his is really saying that over the next few years, all of the CPUs in these data centers will be swapped out for GPUs. Now, when he says all, that's probably a little hyper, hyperbolic, but virtually all of the CPUs will be swapped out for GPUs. And that is not only obviously good for NVIDIA, but the amount of compute, the amount of energy required to do that, um, these are two issues, which um, I think the uh, the intelligent investor right now needs to be paying a lot of attention to. Well, Randy, you're one or two slides ahead of me. Oh, again. no, not again. <laughs> <laughs> As you always are, but yes, you're right. So um, what I'm suggesting here with this post is that people should listen to Jensen much in the way that we listen to Elon. And it's always best to listen to what they actually say rather than what somebody says that they said. Okay. And so I did a, a post last night and I highlighted some of the things that Jensen actually said on the conference call. Not, not every word that he said, but some important areas. And so this was one of the things, and you just talked about this, that we're going through two big transitions right now. Uh, we're going from what he calls general purpose computing to accelerated computing, from CPUs to GPUs. And the $1 trillion of spend that or investment that we've made in data centers essentially needs to be redone away from CPUs <clears throat> into GPU technology, servers, equipment, et cetera, right? And he says that, that that needs to be done because computing the requirements of the energy and the efficiency and the amount of compute that we need is increasing exponentially, even without AI, right? We, we, we just need to redo the data center build out in the world. That, and that's one trend that's happening no matter what. Even if AI stops, which it won't, th this transition still needs to happen. And then layered on top of that, we have this explosion in AI, which demands faster and cheaper and more efficient computing resources. So NVIDIA has two, two tailwinds, a replacement cycle, oops, sorry if I hit my mic, and a new cycle entirely of an entirely new opportunity. Right. Agreed. Now, I would go as far as to say that Tesla with their Megapack business is in a similar situation. Megapacks are helping us go from a fossil fuel driven economy to sustainable energy, primarily wind and solar. You store that energy in big batteries, you discharge that when you need it. That's going to replace our current energy system. And then on top of that, we have also the benefits of AI needing access to a lot of energy on demand. And so the batteries will help with that as well. Okay. Uh, NVIDIA is at the sweet spot of their growth curve on that, and Tesla's just starting theirs. At the very, at the really at the bottom. Yeah. All right, let's jump into NVIDIA's results and kind of dive into a few things. I think it's really quite interesting. This is a chart of NVIDIA's revenues per quarter going back to 2014. And they were bumping along and, and growing pretty nicely, uh, particularly during the, the uh, the pandemic years, they had a nice, nice bump in their in their revenues, particularly from gaming uh, uh, systems, and then they had a little bit of a hangover. And interestingly, during this time, Jensen was talking about the coming AI wave. And remember, they delivered their first AI supercomputer to OpenAI back here. Mm -hmm. And Jensen was consistently talking about the future of AI during this whole period, and everybody ignored him. Does that remind you of anybody who's talking about <laughs> the future of autonomy or humanoid robots? Yeah, 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 <laughs> for right? sure. Yep. So they ignored him and they ignore Elon. Not everybody, but many. Right. And then they hit their sweet spot here. And since then, this is like, this is growth like we've never seen. And so this quarter, they had given guidance that they would produce revenue of about 28 billion plus or minus 2%. Mm-hmm. 
and they actually delivered 30 billion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, AJ tracked their historical guidance versus what they actually did. So back in Q2 of 23, they had given guidance of 11 billion and they produced 13 and a half. Okay. And then they increased their guidance by 5 billion to 16. And they actually ended up producing revenue of 18 billion. Guidance was increased by 4 billion. They produced 22. <laughs> guidance was increased by 4 billion. They produced 26. Guidance is increased again by 4 billion, right? To 28 this quarter, and they actually produced 30.4. <laughs> wow, that's that's pretty consistent there. <laughs> pretty consistent. So there's a couple of things there, right? If if a company is able to provide such solid guidance and then beat it, it seems like they have a pretty good handle on their business. It's not like they're sitting around waiting for orders to come in for their products. I was just going to say that. I mean, this is, I was even thinking this last night during the call again, is that you have, um, you have your order. It's kind of like our, the energy side of the Tesla business. The orders are years out. Yeah. And you know that as soon as you ship this particular shipment, you're probably going to get another order. So, uh, you know, I've had businesses like that where you could easily predict the next quarter because you could you knew that certain orders were just going to be consistently coming in, let's say from a mass marketer, from a from a Target or a Kmart. Uh, but you have other businesses which were, you know, commonly a lot less, uh, a, lot, a lot more difficult to uh, to figure out or, or to predict. Um, let's say you're introducing a new car, for instance, <laughs> it's a lot harder to predict. That's right. And it's the case of NVIDIA where they're not demand constrained, it's more of supply. So this is more an indication of how much supply they'll think they'll be able to produce. Right. right. <clears throat> and of course, they're, <clears throat> they're giving some reasonably conservative numbers and they've consistently beaten those numbers. Yep. By now, two billion. Yeah. Now, what a lot of people on, on Wall Street will point out is to say, well, these beats are less and less and less as a percentage. And that's true. But, you know, we're talking about some large numbers here, right? Yeah. The percentage increase is going, going to go down. Right. Right. It's it's really more of the absolute numbers, I think, at this point, rather than the percentages. Yeah. Right. So here is now their guidance for the third quarter, the quarter, next quarter coming up. And they gave guidance of 32 and a half billion plus or minus 2%. And if you tack on the historical amount that they've beaten by, you're getting up to closer to 35 billion in revenue, not 32. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, again, plus or minus. There's, there is going to be some variance in there for sure. But that increase there looks like a pretty similar increase that we've had for the last, you know, five quarters. In, in With all fear and trepidation that I'm uh, getting ahead of your slides again, <laughs> one, of the, one of the arguments out there has been that, generally speaking, a vacuum uh, needs to be filled. And that the vacuum in this particular case is these margins. And that no company will get those kind of margins forever. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> Randy, your timing is impeccable. <laughs> Everybody's going to think that you've seen these slides before. I know. You, you I, haven't. I, I see these we, we must have a, like a Vulcan mind meld. I'll see if I can do the Vulcan salute. I'm not sure if you can do this, but. Uh, yeah, yeah. Wait, there we go. There you go. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, we must be on the same wavelength there. Um, yes. So margins, um, obviously the blue line here, gross profit margin uh, approached 80%. This quarter down to about 75. There are some good reasons for that. Not a big deal. Uh more importantly, net margins in the mid 50s. Yeah. Uh, pretty solid. So, Jeff Bezos's famous saying is, Your margin is my opportunity. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Right. And, yep. and so, if you're looking for a business to disrupt, this might be a good one to try to disrupt. Now, the, ch the challenge is that these guys are not standing still. No. Right. And some of their competition is trying to get to where NVIDIA is now, much less where NVIDIA is going to be in a couple of months or a couple quarters, much less where NVIDIA is going to be in a year or two. And people don't maybe think about the fact that this is exactly the challenge that the car companies, in fact, this is a big argument on X this morning with Gary Black. You know, Gary Black saying, well, everybody's going to have uh, automated driving. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, Tesla's not going to be all alone. But, Tesla, but all of the same kinds of things that are impacting NVIDIA's margins are impacting Tesla's. 
uh, in terms of the, the complexity of producing this product is not mm -hmm. the same as the, it's beyond the complexity of producing a car. Um, you know, between the, between the need for the chips from, yeah. uh, uh, from a fab that is the horribly difficult to construct fabs. Um, anyway, I don't, we can spend an hour on that, but, uh, this is not an easy, this is not an easy, uh, company to catch. Very difficult. Very difficult. Absolutely. The, the manufacturing of these products of the global supply chain, the, the challenges they have this huge. Now, of course, NVIDIA doesn't actually manufacture their own chips. Right. Uh, they use other companies for that, uh, TSMC being the primary one. Mm -hmm. But still, the, it's a lot of complexity to manage. Yep. Um, here's a nice snapshot of NVIDIA's quarter. Uh, I like these these charts. So you can see the data center revenue, $26.3 is the majority of their $30 billion in revenue for the quarter. Mm -hmm. And they have some other businesses, gaming, which used to, used to be a big part of the company, uh, about a $3 billion quarter business, and then some other smaller parts. Okay. Um, gross margin, we saw 72%, operating margin 62, and then net margin 55%. So pretty, pretty impressive. There's not too many businesses that look like this. Right. Okay. All right. Let's dive into some things. I'd like to look at some things over, over a long-term trend. And so here's their operating income again, since 2014, and you can see it's exploded upwards. Anytime you get that with a company, the stock is going to react very favorably. Sure. Right. And so now quarter to quarter, it's just a matter of, you know, Wall Street's expectations for some of these numbers and whether or not they were, you know, Wall Street may have expected numbers up here and they only deliver down here. Mm -hmm. But don't make any mistake. This is a favorable trend. And if this continues, the stock, the company is likely to do very well. Okay. Now, this is the cumulative operating income now is over $100 billion. Um, in the last 10 years. So that's a pretty impressive number. Here is free cash flow. Uh, so backing out some changes in inventories and capital expenditures, uh, free cash flow did dip a little bit this quarter, but still very solid, almost 14 billion. Mm -hmm. And then over time, uh, they've delivered, um, you know, 85, 86 billion in free cash flow in the last 10 years. Not too many companies have done this. No. Okay. All right. And of course, then they've built up now a nice cash hoard of about uh, 34, 32 ish, 34 billion, maybe. I forget the exact number. Uh, but their cash pile is growing. Mm -hmm. It would be growing even faster if they weren't also buying back stock, which helps create a little bit of an underpinning, a little bit of a floor on the stock price. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. I'm putting my NVIDIA. Fudster head on now. I could say, oh my gosh, look at the uh, selling the general administration expenses for the company. They have like, ballooned. This is out of control, right? $842 million for the quarter. What's going on here? Well, this is one of those things that you should look at on a relative basis, not absolute basis. Sure. So let me show you this chart. Oh. On a relative basis, their SGNA expense now is 2.8% of revenue. Okay. It was running at, let's say, 10 ish. Which would be fine. Which which is not bad. <laughs> yes, yeah. it's, it's a fine number. <laughs> fine number. Uh, I can tell you that, that Rivian and Lucid are not at these levels. Okay. So, so fine. Now the Fudster comes back to me and says, oh, but look at their R&D spend. It's only 10% of revenue. It used to be 25. And I would say that's fine, but you know what? Their re revenues are growing so fast that they can't possibly accelerate R&D any more than they are. And look at this increase in R&D. 3 billion in the quarter, right? Um, you know, it was not too long ago they were doing a billion in R&D a quarter. So they have significantly increased their R&D spend and it would be a mistake just to keep it at 25% of revenues because what are they going to spend the money on? Yeah. They'll just be throwing it here and there. So this company is very well managed. They're, they're investing for the future. And again, it's not to say that co competitors at some point won't displace some of their business, but for now they're in a, an incredibly strong position. But this would be an interesting time. Maybe again, I hope I'm not just jumping ahead of you here, but to make the comparison between the other Mag6 and Tesla, 
every one of the other mag six are maturing even nvidia is maturing they are not exploding into new categories right now they they're every category they're in is now mature does that mean they don't have potential for massive growth no apple all the rest they have opportunities for massive growth but you're not looking at massive moves into completely new businesses where tesla is barely scratching the surface in energy fsd has not come full blossom yet then you got robo taxi and optimus on top of that and who knows what's going to happen with dojo so you have tesla sitting back at what might be the 2014 for nvidia ready to make this explosion as opposed to nvidia having done the job and that's probably why they're PE is at such a lower level. Yeah, I would say that I think Wall Street would probably counter with saying, well, Google has its moonshots group, right? And they they go after things and they're, they are pursuing autonomous vehicles with their investment in Waymo. And I think that Wall Street is a bit gum shy to place much valuation on businesses that, that don't yet produce much revenue today or any <laughs> revenue. Unless you're looking at Elon Musk, who has no misses. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so you need to factor that in. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. And that's why in the cartoon in the beginning, I mean, I, I view Tesla as that that chicken sitting that's on those eggs, yeah. nurturing those eggs. Exactly. exactly. Right. Yep. And not and not one of the dinosaurs potentially being disrupted. Now, the truth be told that those other mag six companies also have an opportunity to benefit from AI and, and they will tremendously, but right. they will also be disrupted in many ways. Right. Right. All right. So um, AJ, uh, all credit to him, nailed the EPS number. Wow. For NVIDIA. Uh, this, you know, the Wall Street expectation, 28.85 billion. Uh, AJ was right on the money. Um, and his EPS number was, was right on the money. So he was being uh, very um, humble here. And he okay. says, you should definitely, you should absolutely follow me if you consider it NVIDIA investments. I would if I wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> that is humble. Boy, there you go. I like his sense of humor. <laughs> so here's his updated chart for uh, the expected revenue for the third quarter, uh, $32.5 billion. It's a $4.5 billion increase over their previous guidance. I got really good scores on these kinds of tests, those IQ tests, you know, where where they tell you to look at something and then project what's going to happen next. I think I could have done this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then here's his projections for Q3. So he's actually thinking it's going to be about 34.7 billion, okay. which would be a 92% year over year increase in revenue nice. and earnings of 78 cents, which would be a 110% increase year over year. Okay. Yep. So, my point with this is, you know, the stock's going to do what the stock's going to do today and tomorrow is as the people that put on trades are unwinding them or whatever they're doing, mm -hmm. right? They were betting on the short term, how the company reported versus expectations or their expectations. But in my view, what really matters is the growth of the company over a period of time. And even next quarter, the year of a year growth in this company is still phenomenal. Yeah, you right? know. One thing that just occurred to me watching this, because I really hadn't thought this through at all, because I, again, I'm not, I'm not really following Nvidia that closely, but they have a growth curve now. Yeah, it is chartable. It is, it is um, reasonably predictable. They don't have another breakout platform or product or way to dramatically increase again that we know of. Well. It, I would counter a little bit and say, yeah, they have this platform, but there's so many different layers now that can be added onto it. They can do the, what do you call it? The, uh, 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 they talk about the layers, the inference layer, and then the actual embodied layer, but I don't think they have any plans to get into the embodied layer. Well, Other I would also, you, in your interview with Jeff Lutz yesterday, he talked about, you know, the growth in sovereign AI and in different different applications of AI that are coming in that, right. that provide further support to the growth here. Right. Right. It's not just going to be one AI model from, you know, from open AI that rules the world. Yeah. Right. Every country may, may want to have their own, right. you know, model, that et cetera. Was a, so that was, that was a very interesting one. 
the yeah. idea of sovereign nations, but they, they, those sovereign nations have to be smart enough to think this way. Yeah, or they may be forced to think this way at some point too. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so here's AJ's then projections for Q3 for for revenue, uh, the 34.7, and that's a you know 92 percent increase. Now, granted, it's it's slowing down. The year over year increases are slowing down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. So you could say it's decelerating in terms of its revenue growth, but you know what? 92% <laughs> is pretty darn good. Okay. Here is um, after tax profit projecting about 19 billion. Remember this number for a, a couple of slides ahead. Okay. Okay. 19 billion. It's a hundred, almost 110% increase year over year. Um, EPS, here's 110% growth in EPS. Mm -hmm. Again, decelerating. Right, sure. they were growing at twelve hundred percent year over year at one point. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's more looking at absolutes than it is percentages. These numbers will get smaller as the company gets larger. Okay, AJ did this neat comparison of Nvidia versus Apple. Apple being the largest market cap company in the world. Are they? And, this, are they this week? Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or Microsoft or somebody else. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you can see Apple has a little bit of seasonality in its net income, but uh, in Q2, 21 billion net income. Mm -hmm. Nvidia did almost 17 billion and projected to do 19-ish billion next quarter. So Nvidia is getting up into the Apple territory in terms of profits. Right. Right. Now, I think a lot of people would say that Apple has a more sustainable business than Nvidia might. But if you think about the first few charts that we talked about in terms of the future of AI and AI factories and changing everything and being foundational to everything that everybody does in this world, then maybe NVIDIA is more, has more of a sustainable business than we realize. Now, that remains to be seen. I, I don't know for sure. There's going to be a lot of competitive pressure in this market. Absolutely. Right. So I, I don't know for sure, but my guess is that NVIDIA's business is actually a lot more sustainable than most people realize today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, not investment advice. Sure. I'm just Guess sharing my thoughts. Project pro prognosticating. Yes. Now, a him, AJ did something to this chart that I wish I would have done, and he beat me to it. He did this. <laughs> right. He's saying what bears think. Right. Every time NVIDIA's numbers go up, they think this is temporary and it's going to go down. Right. And every quarter, they keep posting a higher number. Right. Right. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, from a profitability standpoint, um, operating margin for Apple is about 30%. NVIDIA is up above 60. And this is this is AJ's notation yeah. here, not, not mine. <laughs> right. So that's pretty impressive. Yep. So I think what we should all do, Randy, is go to the uh, tattoo artist and get NVIDIA tattooed on our arm or wherever you want to get a tattoo. I see. Um, yeah, it was kind of a cute cartoon. Even the bull is getting NVIDIA tattooed on his, on his shoulder there. Yeah. One day he may have to take that off and put Tesla on there, much like you know, guys that get their girlfriend's names tattooed on their body. They have to change it later. Uh, he may be wanting to change this to Tesla at some point. Yeah, and we have a lot of folks out there that uh, go under the name Tesla Nair. I guess is there going to be now an Nvidia? How do you? How would you do that exactly? It's going to be very hard to say. Yeah, it is a bit tough to say. I won't even try. But you you made a good attempt. <laughs> All right, so let's let's talk about the stock. Okay. I saw a chart that looked a lot like this the other day. And the, the implication was, oh, my gosh, what a bubble. Uh, and I hear that word from a lot of people. And, and in my view, the word bubble is a tell that they're very uninformed yeah. about what's going on. They're just making an attempt to, to sound smart and putting down NVIDIA stock. First of all, a chart like this over any long period of time is going to look this way, whether you're looking at NVIDIA or Procter & Gamble or Coca-Cola or any company. Because the problem with a chart like this is it is not on a log scale. Mm -hmm. So think about this. The percentage change from $10 to 20, right? It's a 100% increase. Mm -hmm. Would be the same as the percentage change from 40 to 80. Mm -hmm. Yet on the chart, this is four times the distance that this increases. Yeah. So if you use a log scale, 
an equal distance change on the chart is an equal percentage change. I see. So this is actually more the experience of NVIDIA stock. Now it's all over the place, even on this chart. Sure. But it's no longer the crazy hockey stick that we saw on the previous one. Right, there's definitely some ups and downs. Absolutely. For sure, sure. But not, not, you know, oh my gosh, it's a bubble, it's gone straight up, it must go straight down. Right. Okay. Further, it's supported by increases in earnings expectations. And I apologize if this red line is really hard to see. Oh, that's not too bad, not too bad. Yeah. But this is the analyst earnings expectations for the next 12 months. Now they could be wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Analysts are not always right. But what I'm trying to show here is the stair step and earnings expectations, the stock price has, has followed that very closely. Yep. With, with some added fluctuation for fun built in. <laughs> Right. Definitely for fun. Definitely for fun. Um, fear, people trading it, option strategies, whatever it is, moving the stock, mm -hmm. concerns about interest rates, concerns about the election, whatever the fear of the day is, will drive the stock. But over time, stock prices generally follow the company's earnings and particularly their cash flows over a long period of time. Right. Right. So it's kind of my message here is to stay focused on the business. The longer the term, the longer term focus you have, the better. You don't have to worry about some of these fluctuations. They're not going to matter. They will matter if you trade the stock. They absolutely matter if you have a short time horizon. Right. Okay. I'll get off my soapbox. Oh no, it's okay. I like the soapbox. Uh, I was hoping this would be clear. I'm sorry. The, this is the PE history of NVIDIA hmm. going back to 2015. Right now it's trading at about 39, 40 times next 12 month earnings. Right. And that doesn't strike me as being overly expensive. Yeah. Okay. Now let's go back to our old friend, Apple. When Apple was going through its high growth period, its PE was, you know, 70, 80, 85. And then settled down and then got extremely low, I guess, as people were concerned about, you know, oh my gosh, the, the iPhone cycle, growth cycle's over. Uh, the PE became, you know, 10, 15 times earnings. Uh, Warren Buffett famously purchased Apple stock. Yeah. Right. The value, a value company at that point. Yeah. And now Apple's PE is, you know, about 30, 31. Um, so, you know, what NVIDIA is experiencing today is, is not dissimilar to what Apple went through. Sure. And then just for our Tesla fans out here, um, Tesla's trading at about 71 times next 12 month earnings. And previously is traded at a lot higher than that. So the PE is kind of a, a weird thing to look at anyway, but this comparably NVIDIA to me does not look particularly expensive on that metric. An action, a wise investor at any time, uh, the, the wisest of investors would be looking, the PE would be re reflective of five years of future history or five years of future profits discounted back to present value. That is I've I've written chapters and books and and interviewed people on how to get to these numbers and there's lots of different ways to achieve these numbers, but once you've got some kind of a metric, what you want to do is what's going to happen in the next five years and bring that back to present value, and there's no company in the world that's ever had the prospect. Now, maybe they don't get to the prospect, maybe they don't deliver, but in terms of the prospect, this is a historical time in terms yeah. of the prospect. So being at 71 times earnings should not shock anybody at this point. Yeah, I mean, ideally you wanna project out the future cash flows from here to eternity for right. a company, right. right? Right. That's next to impossible. So right. people use shorter time periods and what they typically do is just focus on the next 12 months because that's all they care to forecast. Right. right. There's enough uncertainty in that, let alone, you know, right. year two, three, four, five, six, year 20. Um, you know, good, good luck figuring out what, what those earnings are going to be. But the challenge by using a PE ratio and just looking out short term is for a high growth company, you're going to consistently underestimate where the company's earnings are. Right. And I guess that's good for Wall Street because then they can just keep raising their price targets and, and getting attention for the research in that way. Yeah. Right. But yeah, the PE ratio is a shortcut measure because you're just looking at earnings over a certain time period, next 12 months or even a couple of years for some people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so just, just, you know, it's great to look at the PE, but just understand what its limitations are. Right. Yeah. So in honor of NVIDIA, all Cybertrucks are now NVIDIA green. 
<laughs> and Randy, I think we will leave it there for this show and we'll come back and talk about Tesla and BYD. Well, that sounds like a fun show to do. Um, very interested in BYD, especially uh, I did. I think we can do a little uh, a little preview here that uh, it looks like BYD is doing fine, except for their free cash flow. Yeah, BYD has some interesting little quirks associated with their financials <laughs> oh. uh, that may be worth exploring. Some folks might be interested in that, particularly as it relates to their competition with Tesla. That's right. That's right. All right. Well, as always, thank you for coming on and helping us with the show. And for all of you out there, it has been great talking to you. Thanks, Randy.